Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, appreciate it. A new program you just announced today with the West Warwick Drug Overdose Prevention Pilot Program. Yes. So I'm going to have continue this discussion. Um, all kinds of things going on in Rhode Island. According to the Center for Disease Control in 2015, Rhode Island had the fifth highest rate of overdose death in the United States. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about what this new pilot uh, program is going to do and, and continue the discussion from there. So why don't you tell me a little bit about the program? We'll start with that. Okay. Um, well, uh, I would say probably my, my role is twofold. Um, not only do I go along with officers, um, just to kind of go out on calls throughout the day, but I also, um, one of the major points of the program is to have uh, an outreach effort. So um, calls come in all the time for different things. As you all know, people all call the police um, oftentimes oh, for a yeah. lot of different things. So, many things. Um, so people struggling with mental health or substance use um, issues, um, those calls come in on a, on a general, almost daily basis, um, especially throughout the state and West Warwick as well. So I just kind of will go out either on that call and see if I can be helpful, um, or I will also follow up with people afterwards. Okay, great. And just to introduce you, because I didn't give the full introduction, uh, you are a qualified mental health professional. So Correct. you are working with the West Warwick Police Department. Tell me a little bit about this partnership with the Providence Center, and, and because you have this outreach program that's been pretty successful with Providence and with Warwick, and now you're Correct. expanding into this new uh, area with West Warwick. Yes. Well, um, that the Community Diversion Program is what it's called, um, and it actually started back in 2012 um, in Providence, and then a few years ago in Warwick as well. Um, so it's been successful. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this particular program um, is focusing directly on the substance use kind of opioid epidemic in West Warwick. Um, so I, I know that the Department of Health has been kind of on their radar mm -hmm. um, to make sure and kind of look at what's going on in West Warwick and how can we be helpful. Um, so kind of I, I come in and um, I can say, hey, what's going on? I know you mentioned the QMHP. Um, so that kind of lets me go in and instead of maybe somebody going directly to a hospital, um, it allows me to come in and kind of assess what's going on and point them in the right direction. Sometimes they, may, they might need the hospital, um, so they might be in, in, in that type of situation, or they might just need other resources which I can provide, um, whether it's outpatient, um, if it's somebody that's struggling with substance use, um, then I can offer them different services as well, recovery coaches right on hand, um, so that they can kind of see where they're at and um, take it from there. That's great. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about why West Warwick was a target area for you and for the Providence Center. Why it felt the need to go into West Warwick? Well, I know that... And open the program. Yes. Um, well, I know that back in 2016, um, we had uh, several calls uh, for service at the police department. Um, it's only as of about May 1st, we've had um, 15 calls um, for overdose related. Just yes. And um, an additional three overdose related deaths. Um, so that the, when those statistics were coming through, not only for the state of Rhode Island, as you mentioned, with it being fifth in the country, um, but West Warwick had kind of their numbers as well as all of Kent County, Kent County were up as well. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of send somebody in and have this partnership and to kind of see if we can be helpful. Um, you know, the police are, are there to protect and serve, and this is kind of just one other area that they're able to do that um, and say, hey, we have this person here. Do you want to talk to them? Can they be helpful? Okay. So when you are going out, talk to me a little, you, you kind of mentioned what you do. You're going to be an embedded clinician in the police force. Um, so you'll be out riding along with the officers. So you'll be talking with people. What do you think you're going to see when you're working with people if they don't want help? I mean, what do you do in that kind of situation? How can, how can we make this better? You know? Right, and I'm kind of glad that you asked that um, because the reality is, is that everybody's at different points yeah. um, in their life, different points in their recovery, different points in their treatment. Um, but research has shown that the more context that you make with somebody, the more uh, kind of willing that they'd be able to say, hey, maybe this is something I need. Um, so I think the most important thing to remember is that about meeting the person where they're at. Um, so I might just be that, that next time. I might just be that fourth, fifth, tenth time where somebody says, hey, yeah, maybe I would like to hear more about um, how I can get some help. Um, so I think that it's important to remember that, that 
you know, I'm not expecting to go in and say, okay, hey, I'm here. Yeah. Um, here's um, your miracle. Here's your recovery uh, opportunity. Um, but just to kind of be available. Um, I also have walk-in hours, so we're kind of getting the word out there as well that even if I'm not making contact with you, if I've never met you, I'm at the police station. Okay. Um, even if I'm on the road, come on, walk right in, and, you know, we can be helpful. So, and what you mentioned is, you know, fourth, fifth, tenth time, mm -hmm. if you're going out on a call, um, you know, some people might not have that many times. We're talking about drug death overdoses here. Correct. One hand, when we're talking about this, is this is happening. The same people are overdosing right. this one, two, three, five times and right. being able to be brought back. But on the other hand, some people don't have that many times. So talk to me just a little bit about that state, what it's like to work in that field, and really how we can how we move past this. I mean, you know, we're talking about those numbers. Right. I mean, and that's 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 a challenge, um, especially being embedded in a police department. I think I might have mentioned it earlier, is the fact that um, people are afraid to, to reach out for help. There's always there's yeah. a stigma associated, as we well know, with mental illness, um, and especially with substance use disorders, and that I think we're we're working to kind of change the culture, mm -hmm. um, which is where it kind of starts, so that the people that that aren't having contact, they're just kind of suffering in silence um, to kind of make it more comfortable for people to say, this is going on. Um, because as we know, addiction isn't, isn't what I think people think it used to be. Um, it can be your neighbor, it can be your friend, it can be your family member, especially with the opioid epidemic going on. Um, that, that can stem from anywhere, from something you're totally not expecting. Um, so I think reducing the stigma and kind of bringing about this culture that it's okay, um, please get help. Please, you know, I'm also working with family members. They are also reaching out. They're the, also the ones, excuse me, often calling and saying, this is what's going on with my family member. Um, so kind of working as this, this community effort, this family effort to, to bring about this change. Okay, okay. Um, and, and you just being there, uh, you mentioned that you have an, you'll have an office in Warwick PD. I would think for someone who's suffering from substance abuse, problems that could be a very difficult step to take to be able to walk into a Absolutely. police station but Absolutely. being able to to have a space but being able to walk into a police station if you're an addict right <laughs> and and that's the thing is that the historically um, substance use disorders are are associated with arrest or incarceration yeah. or um, some type of legal consequence exactly. um, and not necessarily to take away from that but um, it's a gradual process. Um, this is a very new program with a specific focus on substance use um, disorder. So I think it's Im it's imperative that people understand that we're not necessarily expecting to say, yes, I need help. Um, but just to kind of start those conversations, just to kind of start, again, that change in culture um, where, hey, we're just one avenue. Um, West Warwick is so small, so it's an eight-mile radius. And, and knowing that the police department is there, again, just one avenue. Um, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. I think that, you know, even when I show up to people's houses um, and I have a detective or an officer with me, um, most people, people are, shut down. are surprised, like, am I in trouble? Yeah. Um, and it's really just getting the word out there that, n no, that's not what the, what the objective is. Okay. Uh, have, have officers gone through training with this so they know, you know, if someone's walking in or someone is looking for help, not to go out and make an arrest, but to, to funnel people to you, like they're looking for help, or maybe they're yes. not looking for help, but we need to get them help. Have the officers gone through the training, so this yes. is happening? Yep, actually before I even started um, directly at the department, I actually went in along with the Warwick uh, Police Clinician and the Providence Police Clinician to kind of introduce and say, hey, this is what we're doing, um, this is what to expect. Um, the West Warwick Police Department has been very receptive and very open to say, they ask questions a lot, like how should we do this, how do you want to do this? Um, what steps can we take to develop a process for people to walk in or to make contact with you? So we yeah. do have things set in place um, that the officers are aware of, um, supervisors, everybody from the chief down to follow specific, this is what's going to happen. So they usually forward me the information um, and I take it from there. Because it can be such a, ch I mean, this is a big change Absolutely. from what we're looking forward. But I mean, if you look at the numbers over the past, you know, since 2009, I was on the, um, on the webpage right here. <laughs> I was on the Department health, of health. Yeah, Department of Health uh, looking at some of the numbers. And let's see, so just from January through March of 2017, already 60 accidental overdoses. That's just in 2017. Right. So 
So we have to do something. So whether it's a program like this right. or, or something else, just being able to change that mentality. Um, and let's see. So in 2016, according to the Department of Health website, there were 336 people who had accidental overdose deaths. Um, that's with an increase of Narcan available to fire departments, to police departments. What do you think it's going to take to decrease these numbers? Do you think it's going to take, you know, an increase in programs like yours? Do you think it's going to take uh, the state intervening like they, they are doing, they have programs available? Do you think it's a community effort? You know, what's it going to take? I think it's probably a little bit um, of everything you mentioned. Um, as I mentioned before, I think reducing the stigma and, cr and creating that culture change is number one. Um, I think the education part of it is also important. Um, some people in the in this short time that I've been at the police department um, that I've spoken to, um, they're not completely educated in terms of what's going on, um, whether it's with their yeah, addiction people or- people don't want to talk about it. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you guys have, have heard about it as well as um, your viewers about fentanyl and, and kind of what's going on with the different supplies that we have going on in the state with different um, substances. And I think that people, at least people I'm coming in contact with so far, aren't aware that you know they're they're getting this and and they're kind of this is where they're at in their recovery or in their addiction and they're expecting one thing um but then they're accidentally getting something else yeah. um so i think the education is going to be a big part of it as well okay so increased education oh, and whose responsibility is that where do where do we fall in that what's the next step do you think that's a good question um i think that these types of programs are a good place to start um, I know that the governor has her task force as well that's kind of stepping in and trying to be helpful as well. Um, it's probably a community effort. Um, and, I, and again, I mentioned family and friends, um, you know, knowing that, hey, my loved one it needs some help. Um, and rather than just kind of pushing them to the side or rather than being afraid to, to yeah. reach out, whether it's because of consequences or because they're afraid that, you know, their loved one um, isn't going to respond positively, I think it's important for, for people to rally together however they feel, whether it's community, family, on a bigger level. Definitely. Um, and we kind of talked about, you, you kind of mentioned this, just the aspect of where mental health comes in. And the Providence Center does so much helping people with, with emotional problems and with mental health disease. How much do you see when you're working with people with substance abuse problems, do you see mental health at the core? Sure. Um, I mean, that's kind of a, a known fact that a, you know, a lot of people um, are dual diagnosed. Um, there's a lot of um, co-occurring going on where um, a lot of people, you know, turn to substances, whether accidentally or whether intentionally, um, because there is kind of an underlying issue going on, um, especially we think of alcoholism and, and things like that, that um, the people I'm encountering, they're, they're suffering from both. They're suffering from both. And so when you're working with when you're working with people and especially with this new program where do you divert people when you're when so let, let's go to the next step sure. like they have if they're dual diagnosed let's say that so mm -hmm. you get them in they're coming to you what's the next step um, you know that's a tough one because it's always a case by case it's basis and I don't I don't want to give that um, yeah, but at totally. the same time first and foremost is always safety and, and um, in terms of prior prioritizing that. So if somebody's going through withdrawal or somebody's experiencing um, a bigger, more severe mental health crisis, is to make sure that they're medically clear and to make sure that they're in safe space. So that's always gonna be the number one. Um, that's something that I look at and assess for immediately, whether they need a higher level of care. Um, and if they do, then that, that's what happens. And they'll go to a hospital and they'll kind of take it from there. Um, but if not, then you look at kind of where they're at. Um, are they already involved in services is a big uh, question. Um, no, do they need that? <laughs> yeah. Do they need? Do they need a higher level? Are they on an outpatient? Do they maybe need to to increase how often they're seeing their provider? Um, so it kind of really depends on where they're at to take it from there. Okay. And so this is happening in West Warwick. You have programs set up with Providence Center in Providence and in Warwick. Correct. Do you see? Because we're continuing to see opioid epi epidemic in Rhode Island, do you see programs like this popping up in other communities in Rhode Island and in other states? Um, I would hope so. I mean, this isn't a necessarily a new concept to Rhode Island. Um, no. There's been uh, other communities around the country that have um, adopted this uh, approach. 
Um, I definitely think it's something for Rhode Island to look at, other communities, other police departments to look at to see where appropriate. Um, I think that the marriage between mental health and police departments is definitely a good one. Um, so I, I would encourage that uh, the other police departments and other communities take a look at it. How do you really measure, can you measure success with this? I mean, w how do you measure that? Less overdose death? Sure. Or more I mean, in the treatment? I mean, those are both probably good measures um, in terms of looking at what's going on. I think it's important, too, to look at kind of number of calls for service um, or maybe somebody, uh, you know, who, who has had three calls for service in a specific period of time. Maybe um, they're in treatment and um, they're in recovery and they're maybe having one call for service in the same amount of time. So I think it's important to maybe not look at um, complete success, but again, kind of meeting the person where they're at. And moving forward, what do you hope to see from this program? You personally? Personally. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a tough job. I know, and to be honest, when you ask that, a couple different things come to mind. I think probably first and foremost, um, I don't want to sound repetitive, but it's to, to kind of reduce that, that stigma um, that substance abuse disorders and addiction is somebody, something that somebody chooses or something that somebody um, enjoys or... Um, you know, I think it's important for people to realize that it, and this gets said a lot, that it is a disease. And I hope that people realize that in addition to the fact that there are multiple avenues um, and that people really just want to help, including the police department. I think we're past, I think we're just in a stage right now where it's becoming such a huge problem that it is a, it's a public health issue. Yeah. So I think everybody doing their part and paying attention to messages like this, it's, it's becoming a bigger issue. And so, but there's still such a stigma. There there's is such a stigma. So whether people want to pay attention or not, it's almost like you have to pay attention. Right? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, we're seeing news stories almost every day about this death or this, this is on the rise or, um, so it is, it's, it's, I think quickly becoming a public health issue. Um, do you foresee this, and we kind of touched on this, do you foresee any communities being adopting something like this quickly? Like, uh, is the Providence Center have any plans on the horizon for anything else, or was it just like, we're going for West Warwick right now, <laughs> and this was the first step that we're taking? I think this is where we're at. Um, I know that we also have recently looked at um, getting a second clinician for Providence. That oh, okay. is a big city, and it's a big department. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's something that's also um, in the works at the moment. Great. But I think that that's kind of where we're at right now. Wonderful. And just um, just to tell people if they're watching, if they have a family member or friend, what's the best way they can, if they know someone who needs help or they themselves need help, what's the best way to do that? Um, I think it's, uh, I mean, it depends on where you live. Um, I would definitely look at your community health centers. I would definitely look at your local hospitals. Um, hospitals, especially in the state of Rhode Island, are um, very open. And if you walk in somewhere and say, I need help, um, they're definitely going to get you connected. Great. Heather, thank you so much. This thank has been such a much. valuable discussion and a program that I think can be so beneficial to the community and for Rhode Island as well. So thank you so much for joining us.